Hey everybody, um, my name is Alicia and I am super excited to introduce our speaker. Her name is Izzy Edwards and she is a 19 year old nature photographer based in Washington. Um, Izzy has spent the last four years focusing on uh, photo documenting owls and she um, is really an, an extremely accomplished owl photographer. A lot of you might already be familiar with her work. Um, and back in 29 or 2020, I should say, um, she actually encountered all 19 unique American owl species. So she's going to share a little bit about her journey with us tonight, um, as well as some of the details regarding the conservation work that she's been able to participate in through Global Owl Project. So I will just go ahead and pass it over to Izzy. Thanks so much for being here tonight, Izzy. Thank you so much for that introduction, Alicia. I'll just go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, let me know if you can see this. All right. All good. All right, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending my presentation. This is Exploring the Mystery of Owls. So I have been in love with nature, particularly wildlife, for as long as I can remember. And um, for the past four years in particular, I have been very focused on North America's owls. And although I haven't been um, into photography for that long, um, I have been checking, I have been um, viewing owls in the wild since I was a little kid. So over these past four years, I have had some incredible experiences with America's owls, including traveling all over the country to view them in their own um, diverse, unique habitats, as well as working hands on with them for certain conservation um, projects as a volunteer. But it definitely didn't start that way. So uh, let me take you guys back to the beginning. This is a photo of uh, me and my dad. and uh, He is one of the main people that um, inspired my passion for photography and nature. And uh, this was taken of us when I was around the age of nine years old. And we used to go on a lot of nature adventures together to view um, all sorts of different types of nature. But one of our favorite trips to go on was a birding adventure up in Vancouver, BC at one of our favorite bird sanctuaries, which is called Rifle Migratory Bird Sanctuary. And we would go up here pretty much every year in the winter to uh, get a look at the birds. And particularly if we were lucky, we would sometimes see owls. And at this point in time, this was before my introduction to more professional wildlife photography. So I was using either my little Canon point and shoot camera that my dad had gifted me, my parents had gifted me for Christmas one year, or sometimes I would use my dad's smaller uh, 40D DSLR camera that he would already put on auto mode and, or he would set up the settings for me and he would just hand me the camera and let me take a few pictures. And so this was one of my very first owl photos that I ever took when I was around the age of nine years old. And I believe this was taken with my dad's 40D DSLR camera. And I was just so excited uh, to get this picture in the moment, just a quick snapshot. But I didn't get into more professional photography into, until quite a few years later, when I was around the age of 13 or 14, um, I had an opportunity to work as a marine naturalist, uh, volunteer marine naturalist on a whale watching charter boat out of Anacortes, Washington. And orca whales were originally my first real passion, wildlife passion in nature, and particularly the southern resident killer whales, which are an endangered subspecies of orca whale. And unfortunately, there's only 73 of them left in the wild. And I was just in love with these orcas, and I still am. And unfortunately, they're just a lot harder to view nowadays because of the restrictions around them being so threatened and endangered that we have to give them their space. Um, but when I was 13 to about 15 years old, I was going on a lot of whale watching tours to photograph and view these orcas up close. And when I was working on the whale watching boat as a marine naturalist educating the guests, one of my main duties was to take a photo of the orcas. And this was a little bit challenge for me at the time because I really didn't know how to use a professional camera, the settings and change the settings well out on the boat for various lighting conditions. 
So at first I was mostly using auto mode, but over time I started getting more comfortable with using my settings and finally learning how to take real professional images. And so this was one of my first photos that I was proud of that I took on um, completely, you know, um, not manual settings, but I shoot in AV mode, which is basically aperture priority mode. So I'm changing the settings by myself and really learning how to use the camera for the first time. And a lot of orcas, as I mentioned before, they are highly endangered. And so my time with viewing them came to an end in 2018, as a lot of the whale watching charter boats were removing marine naturalists and just kind of making their companies like a little bit smaller just due to the less uh, times they were going out to view these whales. Um, so then I kind of had to find a new passion and I almost immediately found it when that fall in 2018, I found my very first long-eared owl. And the long-eared owl, they're a highly nocturnal species of owl that are usually resting in these dense bushes during the daytime. And that's just where this little guy was. And this was up in Canada, right across the border, um, in right across the Washington border. And I, had, I have no idea how I saw this guy who was right in the middle of the spot him. And I crouched down. I was photographing him for just a few minutes. And he opened his eyes to look at me because he heard me rustling around in the gravel. And just seeing those beautiful eyes and just this incredible, intricate plumage, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to see more owls. But how am I going to see more owls? Because before I had to go up to Vancouver, BC, if I ever wanted to see an owl, because that's the only place I knew where to look for them at that bird sanctuary. So the first thing that I needed to do was learn how to locate owls. And owls are hard to find because they, and you can see in this picture, they go well to their surroundings. And each owl is so different. As I mentioned before, we have 19 species in America and each is very unique and prefers their own niche habitat depending on where they live in the country. So I had to first do quite a bit of research to figure out how to find each individual species of owl that I wanted to find. So the first one that I was really interested in finding was the northern pygmy owl, which is a somewhat common species of owl here in Washington state. However, they're extremely hard to find because they look like other songbirds when you're birding. Like they, they don't look like a raptor. They don't look like an owl. So you often look at them and they're like, oh, that's just, you know, I, that's probably a sparrow. And then you drive right past it without, you know, double checking. But I quickly learned uh, that you'd really have to double check every bird if you want to find a northern pygmy owl because you might just be looking at an owl. So in order to find the species, I really had to research what habitat they prefer in Washington and what time of day are they going to be active. And I quickly learned that pygmy owls are actually not a nocturnal species of owl. They're completely awake during the daytime. So you can find them at you know, noon time, in the afternoon, in the morning. There's really no you know, shortage of daylight hours that they're out and hunting. So I, with that knowledge, I then had to know where I'm going to look for this species. So then I researched what kind of habitat they're going to be hunting in and at what time of year. And that was crucial for finding the pygmy owl for me. And it took me a couple years of searching for them after this research, but after a while it paid off. And the pygmy owl really likes uh, the foothills of the mountains in these small clear, small evergreen trees in these clear cuts. So after logging companies has, have gone through and clear cut the old growth, uh, they replant new conifers and these young saplings, the uh, northern pygmy owls really take advantage of for hunting. So that's how I started finding my first pygmy owls. So for living in Southern California, I just decided to highlight three species of owl that are most commonly found in the Southern California area. So you guys can start thinking about what types of owls are living in your habitats. So one of those species is the great horned owl. Now here in Washington state, the great horned owl is one of our more elusive species of owl. And that's unfortunately because our barred owl, which is an invasive species in Washington, is starting to kind of push them out. And even though on a one to one basis, the great horned owl should be able to defeat a barred owl, the sheer mass of barred owl that are kind of populating our local parks is slowly starting to drive down our corn population. But in Southern California, this is not the case. And great horned owls are the most common and uh, popular populated species of owl in Southern California. And that main reason is they have no predators to really, or no other owl species to really compete with. So no barred owls that are really bumping them out of the area. 
So gray horned owls are a pretty nocturnal species of owl. However, in Southern California, they tend to be out sometimes at uh, dawn and dusk hours. So sometimes they'll be out just an hour before sunset or maybe an hour before um, or an hour after sunrise. So they might be out a little bit more in the daylight hours down in California, but here in Washington, they're a little bit more cryptic. Um, they mostly really like forested areas uh, adjacent to open meadows that they can hunt in, and they will really eat anything. I mean, they'll go after rabbits, they'll go after other birds, they'll go after small rodents. Sometimes <laughs> they'll go after small cats in the neighborhood, so you have to be careful. They likely won't take your cat away from you, but they will. I have, here in Washington, we have a lot of cases of them going after the small pets in the neighborhood. So they're quite fierce um, and general, generalist species of owl. The other species that you might see around in Southern California area is the Western Screech Owl. Now this is one of the smaller species of owl and they're only around eight inches tall, so pretty tiny. And they really like to hang out in tree cavities, especially in California. I, I've seen most of my Western Screech Owls in California have been in these little tree cavities where they hide uh, throughout the year, not even when they're just having a nest. So they'll nest in these cavities, but they'll also sleep in them during the winters. So when you're looking for the screech owls, they're also a very nocturnal species. So they're only coming out right around dawn and dusk uh, to hunt, but they won't be coming out during the daytime to hunt unless they're really hungry. Um, but these screech owls, if you wanna find them, just start looking in every um, tree hole that you find and you might just spot one of these screeches or if you hear them at dusk calling. Another species that's really common in the Southern California area is the barn owl. However, the barn owl is much more elusive than these other two as they're very, very nocturnal and they're almost never hunting, you know, during the dusk or daylight hours because the great horned owls will sometimes prey on them. So they have to be extra careful. But they will also uh, hang out in tree cavities in small holes because um, owls don't make their own nests at all, at all. So they have to either find a hole in a tree. So the barn owls like to find tree cavities or in the great horned owls case, the great horned owls will sometimes steal from other bird species. So let's get into start. How do, can you find owls when you're walking through your local parks? So how, what are some good ways to start finding them? And one of the best ways is actually looking at the forest floor, which is funny because you think you want to be looking in all the trees, but sometimes the best signs that an owl's around is pellets on the ground. Now the pellet is what an owl has already ate, a mouse or the rabbit or bull, but it's coughed up all of the bits that it cannot digest. So the fur and the bones, and it turns into this little throw up ball that we call a pellet and they did you know um throw them up right where they roost at during the daytime so if you're finding underneath trees um, you likely have an owl that is roosting in those trees and owls are very habitual which means they're coming back to the same spot to either hunt or sleep day after day sometimes it's not completely routine like they'll move with the season so in spring they'll be in a different area versus winter they'll be in a different area but for long periods of time like weeks at an end they will perch in the same groups of trees over and over again because they rely on uh, safety in those trees and if they feel like they're in a nice concealed spot they'll keep coming back to it so if you're looking for those pellets that's a great way to start finding owls roost another great way to start finding owls roost is called whitewash. And a whitewash is basically an owl's poop or pee, basically a combination of the two that is getting expelled on their roost. And you're seeing this whitewash because it looks like paint splatter. It's very distinct. It looks like someone dumped a can, you know, had a paintbrush and they splattered paint on the tree or the tree trunk or on the ground. And that's a great way to know that it is an owl and not another bird species. And there will be a lot of it. And if you're looking, if you see this whitewash, keep your eye out for pellets on the ground to confirm if this is for sure an owl's roost. Because sometimes sap on the trees can look like whitewash, but the white, true whitewash of an owl will look very stark white and not muddy or yellow at all, just pure white. And that's a great way to start looking for them. Another way to start finding owls is listening for other birds and animals in the forest that will be alarm calling or mobbing. Mobbing is a behavior that these smaller prey uh, birds will do when they're when they find an owl or a raptor in the forest and they feel threatened, so they need to chase that predator out of the territory. 
So this is an American robin harassing a great gray owl, and it is dive bombing its head over and over and over again. And these birds are relentless. They will pull out feathers on the owl's head. They will completely harass them over and over again uh, just to try and get them out of the territory. So if you're listening in the forest and you hear a whole bunch of birds, especially smaller passerines like robins or sometimes corvids like jays and crows going nuts, like really making distress alarm calls over and over again in one specific spot, it's very highly likely that you could have an owl or another raptor in the area. Most of the time it is an owl, at least for me in Washington. I come across a lot of barred owls and great horned owls this way. Sometimes they'll lead you to other predators in the forest, like sometimes I've ran into a coyote that way. And if you live in, at all in bear country, please be aware that sometimes other smaller mammals or uh, other birds will alarm call to bigger, bigger predators, not just owls. So. Just keep your ears out in the forest, um, you know, listen, listening for those um, subtle sounds of the alarm calling. And as you get closer, investigate to see if there might be a raptor in the area. Another great way to find owls listening to their calls at night and then tracking down that grove of trees that they're calling from or that area that they're calling from. And although you might not be able to see them that night or find them, if you identify the area that they're calling from and that grove of trees that they're hooting in, even if it's in your backyard, go back during the morning and uh, in the daylight hours and it's likely that the owl, since they're habitual, will be roosting in that same grove of trees that it was hooting from that previous night. So that's a great way to track down, especially if you're hearing an owl in your backyard and you've never seen it before, that's a great way to start tracking them down is going to those trees at night and then going back in the morning. Another good way to start finding and photographing owls is if you're lucky enough to find a nest. And owls are sometimes not very secretive about where their nests are. And during nesting season in January, um, especially in the late winter months, January, February, March, the owls will be courting. And that means they're going to be calling to their mate and they're going to be finding a nest. And they're not very secretive about this. They'll make it very well known. They'll be calling a lot. And if you're able to track down a nest, which will be something that they have not made, so either a cavity in a, in a tree, or if it's a great horned owl, it could be, um, you know, they took over a red-tailed hawk's nest or a different uh, bird's nest. Um, sometimes they'll, of course, uh, nest in man-made boxes. So if you have an owl box in a little park, keep your eye on that owl box in case an owl moves in. And owl nests are a great way to photograph owls because when owls are tending to their babies, they're going to be very active and hunting and looking for food and constantly on the move. And this is also a time that's very sensitive for the owls and they're very vulnerable while they're nesting. So you want to be very careful if you do find an owl nest to respect it and give it its space. And each owl will be different. Um, some owls will let you closer to a nest than another pair of owls might. So you really just have to read their body language and tell if they are stressed out, you need to back up. Sometimes it's great if you wanna purchase a blind and you've found an owl nest, you can set up a blind and view the owl nest from a respectful distance and you know keep your disturbance minimal on that nest. And of course, never use any artificial light or calling um, playback calls at the nest um, because that could be very detrimental to the young and um, attract predators to the nest. So that brings me to respecting owls boundaries, which I'll quickly touch on. And these are the only photos in the presentation that are not mine. I pulled these off of Google because I actually don't have any photos of owls um, in threat displays. Um, the only times I've seen owls get into these threat displays is when I'm working with them with conservation and I'm getting way too close to them and they feel the need to display um, their threat display in order to say back off. So this is what we call an ultimate threat display for an owl. So this is when they have no other option but to defend themselves. For the most time, for the most part, when an owl is uncomfortable, they're not going to give you this presentation. And this presentation is basically when you are too close for comfort and they feel like their lives are in danger. So they get really, really big and they put their wings up and they rock back and back side to side and they clack their beaks, basically saying, you're too close, I'm uncomfortable, um, you need to back up. And I see this mostly when we're picking up owl babies for um, banding and they'll 100% give you this display because they feel like their lives are in danger. 
But the majority of the time, owls are not going to be this. If the combo, the first sense that an owl is going to be distressed is that they're going to contort their body posture. So the photo on the right is an eastern screech owl, completely comfortable. I'm not sure why it was awake during the day, but it is awake. And it looks comfortable. It might be a little bit alert and definitely looking at the person that's taking its photo. But overall, it feels pretty comfortable. And you can tell because it has its um, body feathers out at a normal level. They're not fluffed up. They're not you know, scrunched in. And the ear tufts are raised, but not fully alert and rigid. But if you look at the photo on the left, this owl is a lot more contorted. It's made its body posture a lot more skinny. It's sucked those feathers in, and it's made the ear tufts on top of its head very rigid. And the ear tufts, they're not actually ears, if, um, although they look like ears. They actually are really only, the only purpose of them is to display an owl's emotions. And when they're straight up sticking very rigid, they're very alert, and they could be hunting while doing this, but most of the times, when you're seeing um, photos of them very rigid, it's because they're stressed. So this photo on the left, if you see an owl start to kind of contort its body and get kind of skinny into that Dracula-like position, you might want to back up and give them a little bit more space or maybe come back another day. And that would be the best to kind of help their, um, their body posture go back to normal so they can feel comfortable. Another thing I want to briefly talk on is um, when you get into photography with owls, and um, some people might be really excited to take an owl photography workshop. Um, these aren't very present in uh, Western um, United States. However, they are more present in the Midwest as well as in Instagram. If you ever see the owl flight, wild owl flight, uh, photography tours steer clear because baiting owls is a huge problem, especially in eastern Canada, where um, guides and photographers will go out and toss out pet store mice to the owls um, from the roadside to get these beautiful trophy flight images of the birds. And they might look like cool images, but at the end of the day, you're uh, really changing the bird's natural behavior, and they're going to start relying on humans and the roadside for food, and that's going to habituate them and get them struck by cars. And it's really just overall not great for the birds. So in general, when you're photographing owls, you want to make sure you're not changing their natural behavior. And that mostly means um, not using uh, playback on them, especially with the nests, and also not baiting them to try and get them closer for images. So that moves me into how I developed my personal photography style. Um, and this is after I really did my research on kind of how to figure out how to find these birds. And now that I'm actually finding them and seeing them in the wild, how am I going to start capturing uh, more unique images of them? So at first, when I first uh, started photographing owls in the wild more professionally, I would get so excited with the initial sighting of the owl that I would just walk right up to the bird and try and get closer and closer and get a close portrait of the owl because at the time I really wanted those sharp details and I think with the lens that I had at the time I didn't want um, I had a lot uh, deeper of a um, depth of field on my, on my lens and I, I didn't want the distracting sticks in the background so what I did instead was I would just go up for these super close portrait bird now looking back on that yeah they're cool and they have some nice detail to them and it was very fun to get those uh, initial portraits of the owls when I was first um, seeing them for the first time. But over time, um, I kind of got a little bit bored with photographing just these close up portraits of the owls. And I wanted to get a little bit more interesting to, um, you know, aspects to the images. So I would try and do flight shots and I would really work on trying to get the owls in flight. And that was a big challenge for me at the time. It was difficult to get them in flight. So that was a fun challenge. And then I also wanted to start experimenting with my lighting. So that's when I moved into more of understanding lighting and the times of days that are best to get the best lighting to photograph these birds and get some unique images. And that's when I really got out and started experimenting with it. So this is one of the first images I took of with backlighting. And backlighting is basically where you know the sun is behind you. And it's, it works best when it's a sunrise or sunset, when the light is really nice and golden. So you can still have. Um, at least here, I was able to position myself so I wasn't, I didn't have the sun directly behind the subject, but it was just a little bit off to the side. So I was still able to bring back the shadows of the bird and create this nice haloing uh, backlighting effect. 
And that was a fun technique to try, uh, as well as this front lighting effect. And then shooting overcast light, trying to get some new images, even if it's not laying out. And then shooting in different precipitation conditions. And this was one of my favorite images that I was able to shoot in snow. And um, that was really fun to get the great gray owl with the snow uh, floating down around it and just shoot in some different conditions. And right around then is a uh, right, uh, okay, it's, this is a last one that I had of um, another backlighting. Uh, photo that I took of this is one of my favorite owls that I photographed in our local parks. I call him Poncho and his mate Poncha, and they were one of the first owls that I uh, started photographing. But right around that time that I was starting to get a little bit more creative with my portrait of owls, I had my first introduction to wildlife conservation. And this was where my friend, who is also a similar age to me, had an opportunity that he met a biologist um, that was working in Umatilla, Oregon, on a project called the Global Owl Project. And he has projects all around the world in multiple different countries. But the one that he was um, mainly working on in Oregon was the Burrowing Owl Project. And so I uh, got the contact info through my friend and messaged this biologist and he offered me to come out and check out the, um, the project and I could help volunteer and do some conservation work there in 2020. So I excitedly went and checked it out. So this is David Johnson, who is the founder of the Owl Project and the Burrowing Owl Project. And he works on it at the uh, the global the global owl project for the um, burrowing owl project is based in umatilla oregon on a chemical depot which is really an interesting spot that you'd think for someone to come and do some owl research on but the story goes is 13 years ago david johnson was called out to the umatilla uh, chemical depot by the military because they were wondering why the population of burrowing owls had gotten so low on the site. And so they had a biologist, David Johnson, come out and check it out. And he basically found that the, the order, the, the nature uh, was all messed up. So what was happening was the badgers and the coyotes, these bigger top predators on the depot that were help building and digging these burrows for the burrowing owls had been killed off by the military over, you know, however many decades with just, you know, the every, the, just the military movement going around on the depot. So over time, there was no more badgers or coyotes to dig these burrows for the burrowing owls. And the burrowing owl population slowly died off. So David Johnson put together this project to start constructing artificial burrows for the burrowing owls, basically being badgers and coyotes for the burrowing owls to create homes for them. So over those 12 years, he built, I believe it was 216 of these burrows and planted them underneath the ground. And it's about uh, four, five feet deep. And he just puts these uh, 55 gallon Costco barrels, uh, they're not Costco barrels, but they were these 55 gallon barrels underneath the ground that he had cut in half. And they basically have a tube so that the owls can go underground and access the burrows. But then there's also a way that David Johnson can dig up the top of the burrow and pull the owlets out for banding and research collect and data collection. So it was really a masterful way to get the owls back to the depot and have homes for them and also have a way to capture the babies easily and ban them and do research with them for the next decade. So that's when I came on was a decade later after all of this work had been put in and while there we were also putting in some of the burrows and we were renovating some of the old ones that had kind of started to crack and fall apart. We were digging up some of those and putting in new ones. But what I was there for was the, um, oh, here's the one of the burrows that we had completed. So this was the hole that we dug. And um, after we were done putting the barrels inside and putting all the tubing in, we put what we call a patio on top of it. So that's all the gravel, which basically keeps the weeds from growing up and blocking the opening to the burrow. And then we armor the burrow so none of the coyotes can dig up the baby burrowing owls. So that's what all the rocks are for on the tube. And that, that's the tube that the burrowing owls enter to go in and, and breed. 
So I was there for the banding of the babies where we pulled out the 20 to 25 day old chicks to ban them. And oh my gosh, were these guys so cute. So we would go in and we would dig up the uh, barrel and we'd pull each one, one by one out. And they made crazy sounds. They made sounds to mimic a rattlesnake to keep predators away. So it was kind of frightening reaching your hand in down into this barrel to hear this rattlesnake rattling of the um, baby brewing owls. But then we'd pull them out and we would put the bands on them. And this is a photo of David Johnson putting one of the bands on the brewing owls. And it was really incredible to not only be a part of this banding experience, but also just to see the overall food chain and the network of just like the ultimate cycle of life that just happened on the depot. And without the badgers and without the coyotes, the burrowing owls were not able to thrive. And just to see how this working system, like each part needed to come together for this niche habitat to be good enough to sustain the burrowing owls. And this really inspired me so that after I left the uh, Global Owl Brewing Owl Project, and then I was able to attend multiple other conservation projects working hands-on with owls uh, as a volunteer over the next couple of years, I really just got an overall appreciation for the habitats that these animals are living in and just how each um, owl species needs its own niche habitat with everything in the environment to be perfect in order for the owls to reproduce and thrive. And so that's what really changed my perspective of photography after I attended some of these conservation projects. And that's when I wanted to start creating uh, storytelling images through the power of composition. And rather than getting excited and going straight up the owl's face and getting these close-up portraits, I wanted to include more of a story with the owls. And I wanted to show the environment that these birds thrive in. And what, you know, these, you know, very beautiful. And I think the environments that the owls thrive in are just as beautiful as the owls themselves. And I was just really excited to start trying to include some of those um, more environmental uh, compositions into my gallery. So this was one of the first images that I took uh, kind of more further backed up and just trying to include a little bit more of the habitat with the shorter owl. And the shorter owls, they really love their crepuscular species of owl, which means they're hunting right around sunrise and sunset and sometimes in the afternoon time. This was like around noon that I photographed this guy. And um, they really like the marshlands in wintertime. They'll migrate over to the lowlands of Western Washington and hunt the marshes uh, for the voles that hide underneath the driftwood and in the cattails. And so this was one of my first photos uh, trying to include those cattails and the driftwood um, in this shorter owl photo. This was um, one of the little northern pygmy owls that I really fell in love with in Washington. And I just wanted to create a little bit more of a storytelling frame with them after I had taken so many close up portraits. And this one was a little bit messier and I was thinking of uh, cropping it really close up at first. And after I thought about it for a while and thinking, well, I think that it tells a little bit more of its story to what environment it hunts in during the winter months and this kind of brushy, um, this brushy bush. And that's kind of, you know, where I find them. I don't always find them on these perfectly open perches with a beautiful bokeh background. It's sometimes they're in a little bit more of this um, dense uh, foliage. So I was trying to get a little bit more habitat inclusive with that. And then this one was another one of the pygmy owls. Just try to include uh, more of the ponderosa pines behind the owl instead of just going up for that, that close portrait. These are great horned owls. And as I mentioned before, um, since owls can't make their own nest, they either have to find a nest or they'll steal from another animal. And so this great horned owl had found a nest in this kind of crevasse and like this rock, this giant rock face in eastern Washington. And it was really interesting to see them in this environment because I had never seen a great horned owl nesting in um, the rocks before. So I wanted to get a little bit further back and just show um, just the sheer cliffside that these owls had chosen to nest on. 
then this one is a barred owl in one of our um, mossy temperate rainforests and he had just caught a shrew in the grass and I was thinking of kind of getting a little bit closer but at first um, at first you know I was thinking about going up for that close shot to get a better perspective of the shrew but then I was thinking if I stayed back I could include more of the forest and show the different layers of growth and um, the different trees that are in the area uh, where this owl was hunting to just create a little bit more of a storytelling frame. This is one of my favorite um, environmental images that I took um, last last year, and this is a great gray owl in its ponderosa pine habitat. And I came across this owl one morning um, after I'd gotten up very early from car camping, and he is just perched right on the side of the trail, um, sitting about 25 feet up in this ponderosa pine, perfectly backlit. And I wanted to include my knowledge of the backlighting um, with the knowledge of trying to getting that in environmental frame. So I put on my 200 millimeter lens when I usually use a longer lens, a 400 uh, to 600 um, mil millimeter lens is usually the length that I'm shooting in. So I, I put on a smaller lens just to get a smaller perspective and get him a little bit learn frame and just include that beautiful environment and show the old growth forest that the great gray owl thrives in. And this is a, another little northern pygmy owl and just trying to show that more dense shrubbery that they love to hunt in on the um, in the winter months in the mountain foothills. And I really liked this one uh, taken last year. This is a fun one of the great horned owl that thrives in this more desert high elevation habitat with a lot of these more um, craggy rock faces. And I was really hoping to get a photo of one of these great horned owls nesting in this type of habitat, but I came a little bit too early in the season. And I was thinking that I wouldn't find one in the rocky habitat because they weren't nesting at this time. But this one, um, I had been walking up and down the cliffside after photographing a pair of kestrels. And when I got closer to this pair of kestrels that were getting a little bit um, higher up into the rocks, I accidentally flushed a great horned owl that was like right next to me in the juniper tree next to me. And I had no idea it was there and I walked right underneath it and it flushed and flew right to the cliff face and landed right on or not on exactly, but I think it was right next to, uh, if you see right to the left of it where all that poop is, the kestrels nest. And so the kestrels went berserk trying to get this great horned owl off their nest. And I wanted a um, smaller perspective for that image as well. This one is a barred owl hunting for its young. Um, on, uh, I think this was taken this uh, May early when the um, fledglings were just starting to learn how to hunt. So this, um, uh, they were just learning how to branch. And so they were really excited looking at their father. This was their dad and he was getting ready to hunt. And every time that he would move his body get like a little bit more excited because he would hear a bull underneath the grass, the fledglings would start screeching louder saying, I would hear them saying, get it dad, get it, <laughs> bring it back to us. So that was really fun to watch them uh, get so excited about their dad hunting. And just these owls are very um, observant and they watch their parents like a hawk, you know, just constantly watching every move that their parents make because they're learning from them. And that's their way of um, you know, getting used to the world and figuring it out on how to uh, take care of themselves. This was a fun one that I took in February. This is a shorter owl in front of Mount Rainier, which is one of our volcanoes in western Washington. And this owl was hunting in one of the northern islands in uh, western Washington, and it was this open meadow, perfect for hunting for shorter owls. And I was hoping to get um, a frame of this guy with Mountaineer in the background because it really helps show, you know, that's a place marker of, you know, where this uh, species lives and where this species is thriving is in western Washington, just north of, um, just uh, west of the Cascade Range and north of Mount Rainier. So I was excited to include Mount Rainier in the frame to just give a little bit more context to um, where this uh, species thrives. This guy was one of my favorite photos I took this year. This is a little northern sawwood owl, and this was taken with a long exposure method. So right after sunset, I had my uh, I had my uh, camera on a tripod, 
and the owl comes out to hunt about 30 minutes after sunset, right when it's getting too dark to see it or autofocus. So I have to manual focus my camera lens on the silhouette of the owl. And then I basically click the shutter and it'll go for however long, one to five seconds. Um, and I just have to, my fingers crossed that the owl isn't moving during this time because if the owl moves at all, then the exposure will be blurry. But luckily out of the 50 photos I took that night, this one photo came out sharp and I was really excited with the composition of it because I had been observing this little Northern Sawwood owl, which is a very nocturnal species only coming out right after sunset. And I've been observing it hunt in the holly bushes in this uh, cedar grove, and I was really hoping that it would perch on a cedar perch because I love the western red cedars that thrive in the lowlands of western Washington. And to my luck, it did jump up on the cedar perch for no longer than two minutes, and I was able to rack off a few photos and only one of them came out sharp. This is another one of a uh, barn owl in a very interesting environment, just showing, showcasing one of the unique places that they can call home. And this is a clay embankment that has slowly over time, animals had kind of made holes in it and it had eroded over time to create bigger holes. And the barn owls had found refuge in this muddy clay embankment, not only for roosting um, for safety, but also to raise their young so they would have babies in that really interesting habitat. And uh, it was fun to just kind of get um, more perspectives of them in such a unique environment. This one um, was taken also this spring where I climbed up this hillside to get kind of an eye level view with this fledgling um, great horned owl that had just found its way out of the nest. And it was branching in this um, moss covered old growth big leaf maple tree. And I was happy to get an eye level perspective and kind of include that backlighting effect as well as an environmental composition with the um, with the tree included. And this guy is a little western screech owl from Northern California, and he was hanging out in a madrone tree. And I was so excited to get this eye level perspective of him in the cavity that I just went climbing up an adjacent hillside and I'm crawling up on my hands and knees and I didn't realize that I was crawling right through poison oak and it wasn't until I had been sitting for a couple hours and I like looked at the plants around me and I'm looking at the leaves and I count the leaves and I'm like, oh, this can't be. And so I text a picture to one of my nature plant plant friends and they're like, yep, yeah, that's that's poison oak. So a few days later, I was itching pretty badly, um, but I'd say it was it was worth it <laughs> for a little bit better perspective of this um, really interesting tree cavity with this western screech owl inside. And this was when he was just starting to wake up for the hunt. And this was an interesting Western screech owl because I was so ready for a long exposure photography shoot of this guy. I had my tripod set up. I was ready for the long exposure. And he ended up flying out of the tree 30 minutes before sunset. And I was not expecting that. So I looked up and he was gone. And I, I he must have flown without me even noticing it because he um, he was eager to get his hunt on that evening. This is a taken with a shorter millimeter lens um, when I had an opportunity to get more of a wide angle with this great gray owl from summer and he was hunting for about a couple hours, but then he kind of gave up after a couple failed attempts to the forest floor. And so he was kind of just resting on this very tiny perch and he allowed me to get a little bit closer with my smaller middle, uh, millimeter lens in order to get a full landscape scene of him in the old growth ponderosa pines, which is one of my favorite habitats that this species hangs out in. So is another fun one um, to get a more eye level with uh, a barred owl in its habitat. So I actually laid down on my belly to get uh, a more of an eye level perspective with this guy that had jumped down onto the ground to um, capture a mouse or a hole or something like that. And that was a fun one to get. I believe this is the last one of the evening. This is one I took in early spring. And again, I really love these western red cedars that are in western Washington in these kind of temperate rainforest-ish environments. And so when I saw this male barred owl perched on this open cedar perch, I knew I couldn't just go for um, a simple portrait of him. So I went 
back with my 200 millimeter lens and I got far enough back that I could to get this red cedars as well as the old uh, growth big leaf maple in the background to kind of showcase his more of his environment and get, get him a little bit backlit as well. So the key points of the presentation. So if you want to start finding some of these birds um, for your own, uh, start researching the species that live in your general area to get an idea of their habits and where they might be thriving, what type of forest environment they're going to be living in. Use those telltale signs in nature to locate their territories, the pellets, the whitewash, mobbing behavior of the other birds and animals. And listen closely during late winter, early spring months for the courting behavior. So if you do want to find an owl's nest, uh, make sure you're listening in those months um, for the owls going nuts, call into, go, call into each other, listening to their mate, trying to find a nest because they will make it known. And then, of course, respect their boundaries while doing so and give them space and read their body language. So if they're contorting their bodies skinny or if they're puffing their feathers out to give them a little bit more space. And try those creative approaches at capturing them um, in a unique light. So not just uh, the close-up portraits all the time. Of course, when you first see them, that's definitely what you'll go for. I, I always love getting you know, a close-up portrait when I first see a species of owl that's new to me. But then, of course, you know, try to include a bit more of their environment and in, um, in your images. And then share your experiences and have fun. But yeah, then I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Izzy. Um, I think we have um, a question or two in the chat. And then if anyone just wants to ask a question, that would be great as well. Um, so it looks like uh, Steve shared that he bought 83 acres back in the 90s um, in the California Coastal Range Mountains. Um, he wanted to protect that area from development. Um, but 90% burned in the LNU complex fire, which was the third largest fire in California history. Do you know what happens to um, owls during wildfires and are they resilient enough to quickly inhabit the same area again? That's a great question. Um, owls are actually pretty surprisingly resilient. Um, however, wildfires do impact them. And the best um, thing I can, population of owls I can reference for that question would be the California spotted owls up in the Sierra Nevadas. A friend of mine, a biologist that surveys the California spotted owls every year and has for the past uh, few years. They had the Caldor fire that ripped through in 2020 and it destroyed, I think, like something like 70 or 80 percent of their populations, that district's populations, pairs and their um, nest trees and their habitats were completely burned. Um, however, the next year and the next and this year in particular, um, they did have a big bounce back of those pairs and they did come back and return to their um, nest sites. And I believe if their nest tree was severely burned, they would have to find a new nest tree. But if the tree was still kind of salvageable, they would still stick to the same nest tree, even if the area had been burned. However, that's just for the California spotted owl. So I'm not sure how that translates to every other species of owl because I'm sure they all deal with uh, wildfires very differently. Um, and I'm sure during the fires, they do find temporarily different areas to um, live in, but they usually do, at least with the California spotted owls, return and try to salvage their old territories. Awesome. Thank you, Izzy. It's good to know, at least with those owls, they do return. And thanks for sharing your knowledge on that. Um, it looks like we have another question from Vince. Have you experimented with exposure bracketing and high dynamic range processing? Um, I have not so much with that, unfortunately. I will have to check it out more. No worries. Okay, um, unless I'm missing anything, it looks like those were all the questions in the chat. Did anyone want to vocalize a question? Okay, I'll ask a question. Um, 
is he is there one owl that like if you had to choose just one owl species for the rest of your life that you would be spending time with which species would that be well for the longest time i would have said it was the great gray owl because i've spent a lot of time with them in very beautiful habitats like that ponderosa pine habitat that i shared before but lately this year i spent a little bit more time with our local western screech owls and i fell in love with them because they are their expression they're they're <laughs> They're extremely uh, charismatic and their expressions are hilarious. And um, I just, I think they are one of the more interesting species I've ever watched when it comes to terms of behavior. It's just a little bit more difficult to watch them because whereas with a great gray owl that might be hunting during the daytime, because I have seen great grays hunt in the middle of the day, which would be very cool to see. The screech owls are much more nocturnal, so you don't get to see them during the day as often, but it's really fun to watch them right at sunset start to wake up and they move around and as they get ready for their evening hunt, um, that's really fun to uh, spend time with them. So I'd, I'd probably say screech owl. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That motivates me to want to try to find a screech owl myself. So thank you for sharing. And um, it looks like Cynthia is asking, what is next for you, Izzy? That's a good question. I really love all the path of conservation as a career. Right now I'm trying to do just that. So I'm trying to find, I in Washington State, we have a really cool program for our school, uh, school systems. So uh, in high school, I had the opportunity to do this program called Running Start, which allows you to finish your first two years of college while you're still in high school. So I was able to get my associate's degree while I was still in high school. And then when I graduated, which was last year, year um, I was thinking about taking a break for photography which I did and I had a great time and um, now I'm just trying to figure out either if I want to jump into a career right now so I'm trying to look for work or if I want to finish my bachelor's degree which I think I'll end up doing in the spring. Fantastic thanks so much for sharing um, that sounds like um, a really bright future for you either way and I'm glad you've taken that time to explore does anybody else have a question for Izzy before we wrap up? Okay, it looks like John is curious about um, how did you learn to edit your photos? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, at first, my dad had some great tips for me on the first thing he told me that I'll always remember is like bringing down the highlights first and bringing up the shadows and like messing with those uh, basic sliders in Lightroom. And that was the main thing that I started editing was just moving the sliders and highlights down and shadows. I, that's at least the best way I found to start editing a photo to kind of get the details out and then I'll work with things later. But over the years, um, I don't know, I kind of was a lot of trial and error. Um, I'm not too much of like, I, I like YouTube, but I didn't get too much into watching YouTube videos for editing. So it was mostly just kind of uh, self-taught the sliders and I got into the mask tool in Lightroom. And ever since I started playing with the mask tool, my photography has like completely changed editing wise. And I will never go back to not using the mask tool. So using the mask tool for like fine adjustments as to brightening the eyes of the owl here, or like darkening a certain aspect of the image. So just kind of dodge and burning. Um, that's that's really helpful as well as um, over time, after a couple of years of using Lightroom and getting more proficient with it, I, I started using Photoshop a little bit and I'll go into Photoshop to remove like use the um, lasso tool or the clone stamp um, or what is it called the the healing brush tool to basically clone out any distracting sticks like if there's a stick in, like body of the owl that I want to get rid of I can quickly get rid of a stick or something or a leaf that's in the way. But yeah, mostly just kind of messing with it and uh, trial and error. <laughs> that, that's awesome, Izzy. Thanks for sharing that, that kind of growth experience with editing. And it looks like we have another question. Um, how can we impart slash translate your love of these birds to our young students at the elementary level? Anywhere to access your photos? Oh, yeah. Um, you can definitely access my photos on Instagram. I'm there on Northwest Wildlife. Or if you want to check out my website, I have a website. It's Isabel Edwards Photo. 
and dot com and uh, it's just a smug mug website but i try to keep it updated but sometimes <laughs> it's a little <laughs> i lack a little bit on updating it but yeah um for sure awesome okay does anyone and i'll drop your website link in the chat um does anyone have any other questions for izzy Awesome. Okay. I, I have a I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I I'm trying to um, do it through your chat, but I don't know how to send it, so I apologize. But my question is: Have you ever been an, interested in exploring the owl, owl species in other areas of the United States, or have you already done that? Yeah. So in 2020, I went on. Um, I called it my Owl of the Year, where I wanted to photograph all 19 owl species in America. And I didn't fully complete that goal, and I still haven't. I have photographed all 18, 19 species of owl in America. I have encountered all 19 now in different areas of the country as well. I think the farthest I've gone was um, New Jersey for an eastern screech owl. And then I also went to Arizona and Utah for a Mexican spotted owl, as well as the elf owl and whiskered screech owl. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've uh, traveled a decent amount for them, and um, it's been been really fun. Which owl have you yet to photograph again? Oh, yeah, sorry. I think That's okay. That. Um, the boreal owl was the one that I have not photographed, but I've encountered him about him or her <laughs> three or four times. Um, the first time I encountered the boreal owl was in Mount Rainier National Park here in Washington, and it was just um, an hour after sunset, and it did its little autumn spew call right next to me, but I wasn't able to get eyes on it. And then the next year, I had a similar encounter where it did its autumn. They make a, a very, it's like a little choo, choo call, and so I heard that right next to my head, but I couldn't see it again. Um, and then I also heard its song last spring, and that was a very beautiful song to hear. They have a very um, interesting call, um, but I have yet to actually photograph one. So that will be my lifelong goal at this point <laughs> for the owls is to photograph a boreal. Well, it's still impressive that you've seen them all. And um, one last question, um, when it comes to finding owls, um, do you use uh, eBird, Audubon, Audubon groups, or are there other methods you use uh, to locate owls in your area or in different areas? Oh yeah, I should have mentioned um, eBird and like iNaturalist are great ways to start finding general areas of where to photograph owls and where they're going to be, where certain species are going to be hanging out in your region. I do want to warn that like uh, sites like eBird, especially when it comes to sensitive species like owls, can be a little bit detrimental to their uh, privacy and locations, just with uh, sometimes a lot of crowds of people can come up and disrupt um, their, their natural behavior. Uh, but overall, those are great um, apps to use, and I have used them in Washington, especially for the more elusive species that I don't really know where to start looking for to find those areas to go in um, certain regions to look. So that and also i have like friends in the area so word of mouth like i have friends that'll say hey like i heard of like a western screech owl over in this area if you want to look for it or i'll tell friends that i've seen a barred owl so definitely like we have like a social network um, locally that like a couple of my friends will let me know if they've seen a more elusive species um but when it comes to like the more common barred owl and great horns and stuff, I don't tend to need to use the eBird or iNaturalist as much as the more elusive ones. Would you say too, um, like you mentioned, like the crowds of people and things like that, do you find yourself being more protective like on social media and things like that and, and just protecting locations? Yeah, I think like I definitely have people ask a lot of the time, you know, um, where can I come, you know, in Washington to see this particular owl species and uh, when it comes to the more like um, bold and generalist species like especially the barred owl which is an invasive species. Um, in Washington state, I'm a little bit more comfortable with like 
telling people where they're hanging out because I know that crowds are not going to congregate over a barred owl. But when it comes to the more sensitive species, um, I definitely am a lot more private and secretive about their locations. And I'll definitely tell people what habitats to look for them in and um, what kind of area you'll find them in. But I won't be giving away exact locations even to close friends just to in case it could turn into a bad situation. That that makes total sense. Thank you for sharing. Um, well, Izzy, this was really amazing. Um, thank you so much um, for sharing all of your beautiful photos and knowledge. And we really look forward to seeing what you do next. Um, anything else at the last minute, anybody? Okay. Looks like that's it. Yeah, amazing job, Izzy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks for coming.